Good evening, everyone, and welcome. I'm Lauren Gates, your host of this evening's Special Airway Health Solutions Conversation Series with the radiant Dr. Susan Maples on Pediatric Airway Health. Welcome, Dr. Maples. We're thrilled to have you. You, I'm thrilled to be here, Lauren. I know this is our second conversation, and I always am so excited to see what you have in store because whenever I hear you present, you have so much energy, so much passion, and so much wisdom to share that we're really appreciative of you coming here tonight to share it with everybody. So tonight's topic is pediatric airway health. And before we dive into that, um, what I would like to do is just give you a formal bio because some people don't know who you are. And I really love to, to kind of give some color behind, you know, everything that you bring to the table and kind of how you got there. So allow me to go ahead and read your formal introduction. Dr. Susan Maples leads a successful insurance independent total health dental practice in Holt, Michigan. She brings preventative and restorative dental expertise, a passion for mouth body total health, a master's degree in business marketing and 35 plus years of experience in private practice. In 2012, Susan was named one of the top 25 women in dentistry and one of the top eight innovators, otherwise known as disruptors in dentistry. Susan is the immediate past president of the American Academy for Oral and Systemic Health, AOSH, and she is the author of Blabbermouth, 77 Secrets, Only Your Mouth Can Tell You to Live a Healthier, Happier, Sexier Life, and recently finished her book titled Brave Parent, Raising Healthy, Happy Kids Against All Odds in Today's World. She is the developer of the Hands-On Learning Lab, an, inter, uh, an interactional science-based learning program for dental patients and selfscreen.net, an educational screening tool for patients and clinicians to uncover signs of illness, such as pre-diabetes, -di pre diabetes, obstructive sleep apnea, uh, airway disorders, acid reflux, and chronic systemic inflammation. Susan was a co-investigator in an award-winning diabetes research study entitled Diabetes Detection in the Dental Office, and she is also the creator of Total Health Academy, a robust online learning curriculum for dental teams to develop a complete oral systemic dental practice. So you've been busy, my friend. <laughs> Trying to make tools to help people make it easier to learn. <laughs> right. And and I, I have to shout out that you received your DDS degree from University of Michigan. So go blue. They had a big game. So I just wanted to give a shout out to that. And your MBA, you were saying you had your MBA at a program that was affiliated with the University of Michigan, right? It was an interesting group. It was just physicians and dentists. Our cohort was 38 people who had been taking a smattering of courses in, in business and they put it together as an executive program, uh, Madonna and University of Michigan. So that was a lot of fun. Wonderful. Well, thank you for sharing your wisdom with us. I do want to just give a couple of disclaimers before I poll our audience. Um, actually, I'm going to poll the audience while I give some disclaimers. This way we can um, uh, go ahead. I'm just going to be host. Um, I'm just going to have Jay, if you could just bring up the poll under more, you can launch the poll that's there. And I'm going to go ahead and read the disclaimers. Uh, the views presented are the opinions of our speaker and are not necessarily affiliated with Lauren Gates and Associates in Airway Health Solutions. The following webinar is provided for educational and informational purposes only and does not constitute providing medical advice or professional services. The information provided should not be used for diagnosing or treating a health problem or disease, and those seeking personal medical advice should consult with a licensed physician or dentist. Always seek the advice of your doctor or qualified health provider regarding a medical or dental condition. And some housekeeping items, we do offer free CE tonight. We're happy to do so along with free recordings as part of our airway health movement, but you must be in, in attendance for the entire program. Zoom software tracks your attendance, so we do not need a code or a survey. At the end of the presentation, we will also hold a live digital raffle where one lucky attendee will receive a free virtual admission to our upcoming star-studded event, Airway Palooza, March 15th and 16th. The winner must be present to win. So I I think that we're going to uh, skip the poll just from technical difficulties here because we have a really exciting evening. I'm going to give the floor to you, um, Dr. Maples, and go ahead and share all your passion with us about this pediatric airway you know, health and the little ones. And Lauren, I know you know that I go by Susan, but the audience- No, but I, I was going to let you tell me that, so <laughs> I didn't want to be presumptuous. By the end of the night, you'll all have my cell number and my email address, and, and so we'll be friends, and that'll be great. And I hope to see every one of you at Airway Palooza. It is by far the best airway meeting of the year. And 
Uh, this woman is a rock star. I don't know how you do it, but that was the most incredible meeting. And I know it's going to be another awesome, awesome meeting. Thank Super you. fun, you guys. It's memorable, very memorable. Okay. So we're talking about breathing tonight and its impact on airway. I love this quote. I'm super passionate about children. And I hope that even though it's eight o'clock at night, my passion will show, shine through. Um, childhood is not a race to see how quickly a child can read, write, and count. It's a very small window of time to learn and develop at the pace that's right for each individual child. And I really believe that when there are airway restrictions, someone sent a heart up on the side. I love it too. And let me tell you, when there are airway restrictions or sleep and breathing disorders, we are robbing a child of, the, of a poem they never wrote, of a play they never acted in, of a sporting event they never got to participate in. And I'm getting a little emotional right now only because um, that was part of my childhood. And I felt, you know, the, those inadequacies followed me along. And I'm grateful to have been lifted out of that by a physician. And if I have time, I'll tell a little bit of my story at the end. But this is really what it's all about. Allowing children to find their own place, to be their own person, to see the world through the eyes they were meant to see and not to be sick and tired. So yes, Lauren mentioned I created a whole bunch of um, opportunities for you all to learn. And if you're curious about any of these um, I'm going to have a way for you to reach out to me. Many of you have Brave Parent, have read Brave Parent. And uh, what I love about the book is it's not strictly airway. It's all pediatric health, evidence-based, but gives you really, really nice ways to talk about difficult to communicate subjects like breathing and sleep disorders um, with parents. So I hope that you enjoy it. Now, um, the reason I got interested in this is not because I'm a pediatric dentist. I do love kids and I love seeing kids, but I am so unbelievably tired. You know, once you see it, you don't unsee it. Obstructive sleep apnea it affects 26% of our population, may even be more than that. And out of that, 22% don't know they have it and 4% know they have it. And where are they learning it? In the dental office. So once we see it, we go, oh my goodness, this person's at risk of stroke and heart attack and um, hypertension and, uh, and really young people too. So this is a young man and we see this facial deformity and airway deformity and we don't unrecognize it. I mean, once you see it, you see it. And what I really started thinking was, how do we predict and preempt this in children? Because the policy on pediatric obstructive sleep air airway is from the American Academy of Pediatric Dentistry is now, thank goodness, that um, that we are as healthcare professionals, dentistry is, is supposed to be routinely screening children um, for increased risk of obstructive sleep apnea. That isn't, th those are risk factors, not for OSA and facilitating medical referrals when indicated uh, and creating a healthcare team to support kids. Now, very few people are doing that, but most of us on this call recognize that we begin with healthy sleep and we move on to upper airway resistance syndrome with flow limitations and then snoring and then obstructive sleep apnea. This is a continuum. And when you get to obstructive sleep apnea, it's an, it's an entirely other uh, sort of trajectory where you start at the beginning with what we call mild. I think those those words are weird, but um, you know, if you're if you stop breathing ten times an hour and you sleep seven hours, that's seventy times a night. That doesn't sound mild to me. Anyway, when we see this, we know it didn't start here. It started here. And so I started looking younger and younger, thinking we have such an opportunity to change this child's future, to unleash his human potential or her human potential to be who they're meant to be. And, you know, this has been long recognized. Christian Guimano said upper airway resistance syndrome, which is the beginning of this trajectory, is more common in children than obstructive sleep apnea. And still, we don't have ways to really measure and monitor that accurately. So we are still in our infancy in terms of our ability to uh, again, predict and preempt, especially if you're including 
um, EMTs and family docs and pediatricians in this diagnosis. They know nothing about the mouth. So the telltale signs that we look at in the mouth are invisible to them and it's our job to help them. But that study went on to say children with sleep disordered breathing have a maxillomandibular, uh, that they should have a maxillomandibular examination to assess the need for, for orthodontic treatment to expand the oral cavity. Now, many of you know this, and many of you are involved in interception where we take a child and, and we expand the upper and lower arches to create better tongue space, a flatter palate so that the tongue can find its resting place, its neutral place on the palate and breathe freely through their nose. Many of us are also involved in these little trainers like myo munchies, even before we start expansion. I love this picture because you can see the mom practicing with the child while I'm teaching them to put their tongue in the garage. Can you see the mom with her tongue out? So cute. Um, or we're practicing myofunctional therapy. I know there are myofunctional therapists on this call. Or we're, I mean, there's a whole, are we referring for tonsils and adenoids? Um, there's a whole lot that we can do. Um, but I love this quote by Einstein. I'm neither clever nor especially gifted. I'm only very, very curious because I am a fan of intellectual curiosity. And guess what? You are too. You are too. Because if you weren't, you wouldn't be here. Someone named Carrie just raised her hand with a question. So Lauren jot that one down. We'll save some of the questions to the end. And Lauren, feel free to interrupt me if people ask questions that you think are pertinent and that I should stop because I don't need to finish my agenda. We can we can be done early. I just want to be, you know, helpful. Well, so we go from, gosh, what am I seeing here? What is this? To, hmm, what does the literature say about that? And really diving into what's been what has been documented because documented literature, even though it comes to us in small slices is super important. So when we look at the impact of mouth breathing, sleep related breathing disorders, nasal congestion and compensatory mouth breathing and what I call the atomic march or the allergic march, these are some of the things I'm gonna to cover tonight. I was trying to figure out what do I want to cover? I'm going to have a full day with some of you I hope all of you, um, through Airway Health Solutions. And I thought about giving you kind of an overview, a smattering of what we talk about that day. But instead, I'm going to do a little deeper dive into something that if this is the only time I get to meet you, I want you to recognize this one piece that's often left out of airway discussions. And that is this allergic march that causes, again, um, nasal congestion and mouth breathing and then as, as it relates to sleep-related breathing disorders, and then also what causes it, which is gut microbiome diversity problems, and then what are the causes of that? So we're going to take a deeper dive. Everyone on this call knows that we should be breathing 24-7 through our nose. Uh, I like to tell my patients, how often should we be breathing through our mouth? About as often as we eat through our nose. But we are very lucky that we have the mouth in case we need to use it for a backup valve. If someone pinches our nose and we can't breathe, we can always breathe through our mouth. If we get a cold or uh, congestion in our nose, we can use the mouth. But breath should be silent and we should be breathing with our lips closed, our tongue suctioned up on the palate in a neutral resting position and um, through the nose. So Christian Guimano, he was a the father of, of obstructive sleep apnea and sleep medicine as we know it, he basically explained to us that he thought that the postural maladaptations and that the abnormal oral facial growth patterns that we were seeing in as a result of processed foods and, and other issues in today's world caused the mouth breathing. But Saroosh Zaghi, who is a protege of Christian Guimano, an ENT surgeon in California of the Breathe Institute, um, basically repostulated this and said, it's really the mouth breathing that causes the abnormal oral facial growth. And this is what we believe today. If the, if the tongue, if the mouth is open, the tongue is low. The tongue doesn't get to win the pushing war. It's a big war. When a little child is born, their head is only 20% their adult size. By two years old, it's 80%. 
The mid-phase development is enormous during that time. It takes a very strong set of muscles, 16 muscles of the tongue to push the upper arches out and flatten the palate and push the upper arch forward. And also then the lower arch responds accordingly. If the tongue is low because the mouth is open, the facial muscles in the buccinator win. They push in on the face and create a narrow restrictive face. And we know this, right? We know that we get thwarted uh, mid-face development and that it impacts the, the home where the tongue is supposed to live comfortably in its resting position for the rest of our lives so that during REM sleep, when all of our muscles are paralyzed, we're able to hold our tongue out of the airway. But we are needing to recognize that in the infant oral health exam. Now, I don't know how many years it's been, and I should know this. It's probably been 15 years since we've been asked to do an infant oral health exam under age one. Every dentist for every child, a child should have a dental home under the age of one. Why did we recommend this? because of the caries disease problem we see today, early childhood caries. And I'm not going to go into early childhood caries, but that is the number one reason it's 100% preventable. If we can stop swapping spit and spreading strep mutans and we can ratchet down the sugar and all of that. But what we also want to do under the year age one is a pediatric airway evaluation. And very few people know how to do that. Most of the people on this call know how, and maybe some of you are even taking for granted that everyone does, but very few people know how to do that. So it's super important. I love this quote, few things in life are as difficult or as nourishing to our souls as change. We cling tenaciously to the status quo, wallowing in its familiarity and suffocate ourselves. In our profession, we have been asked to change and yet we are very slow to do that. And so I encourage you as leaders in our profession to reach out to colleagues and help them understand this and talk to them about our obligation and opportunity. So when we do an infant oral health exam, we look at um, airway, we look at all of these symptoms that are parent reported and clinical signs. And we're gonna talk a lot more about those, of course, in our full day meeting. And many of you know those symptoms and signs. I like to separate symptoms and signs because it makes it easier for me to educate my medical professionals um, who are supportive of what we're doing and ask them to be part of this. So we write letters to their doctors. But again, we have this problem. We have a lot of kids who are super goopy, super runny nose and super stuffy. And thank goodness they can breathe through their mouth or they would fail. But this is a very frustrating problem. And this little girl has that issue. You can watch and see how stuffy she is. Apple, apple. Apple. She is not a well child. You can see the dark circles under her eyes. She's half masked. Believe me, she's not tasting that apple because she can't close her mouth and taste it. But is that chronic nasal congestion from what we call nasal disuse, from a habitual problem of breathing through her mouth, where when we breathe through our mouth, the nose becomes goopy, the um, turbinates become enlarged, the uh, mucosa becomes inflamed, we produce more mucus just by breathing through our mouth as a habit, or is it allergies? I will tell you that allergies are considered the most common cause of nasal congestion in children. Obviously, when we're congested, we have to, again, um, uh, mouth breathe. And when you mouth breathe, you cause more inflammation or nasal, nasal disuse. So what's happening with the nose, all the magics in the nose. Again, we warm, humidify, cleanse, and purify the air through our nose. When we take it in through our mouth, we are missing out on all the magic. So that becomes a real problem, not just for mid-phase development, but for oxygenation and for energy and for children sleeping well. Now, uh, this is what we say about nasal disuse. You either use it or lose it. 
But let's look a little more closely at allergies because allergies, asthma, and autoimmune disorders are all on the rise. In fact, skyrocketing. We've had a 50% increase in allergies just in the period of time from 1997 to 2011. Today, one in 13 kids has allergies. And when I say that, 40% of children with food allergies have experienced severe reactions visiting the emergency department for that. And our cohort, the medical colleagues that we work with, they're pretty quick to medicate with allergy shots and then over-the-counter steroids and um, decongestants. But what if we could, again, get back to the root cause and predict and preempt this? It turns out we get a lot of clues as infants. We start this thing called the allergic march. It's also known as the atopic march. It's skin irritation such as eczema, bumps on the skin, and then grows into food allergies and then seasonal environmental allergies, and then asthma and and, um, autoimmune disorders. So if we look at the atopic march, we typically start to develop uh, food allergies at about a year and a half, and and then we start to get this chronic runny nose, the rhinitis at about three years old. So what I'm going to suggest is though we conventionally look at airway disorders from a dental um, standpoint of looking at habit correction, uh, both in terms of breathing and pacifiers and thumbs, guided growth, which we often do with myofunctional therapy and trainers, and then orthodontics or orthotropics or expansion. And we do this sort of with increasing age. In fact, most orthodontists won't touch a child for expansion until they're six although many of us are doing these expansions in three and four-year-olds routinely. So um, uh, so that's what I'm suggesting is that we change our thought pattern into looking at airway ident- or allergy identification first in infants, especially in that infant oral health exam, where we could start talking about eczema and start talking about chronic rhinitis or any food sensitivities they're having. Um, looking at what they're, what's going on with their GI system um, in terms of bowel movements and things like that. I learned most about this when I did the research in Brave Parent for chapter three, which was digest, supporting the bugs in your kid's gut or their gut will bug them. So what we notice about GI dysfunctions that are also on the increase, things like IBS, irritable bowel syndrome, and ulcerative colitis and leaky gut, other digestive disorders, is that we also see an increase in autoimmune disorders to go right along with that. It turns out that the gut microbiome is um, to blame. And what's happened in the last 50 years is that we've cut our microbiome diversity in half. And there are reasons for that, but we want is what we want is more bugs, not less. For every human cell, we have 11 bugs living on us or in us. And in an adult, we carry 10 pounds of bacteria in our gut. And the more diverse, the better. Many of these are commensals that are just riding along. Some are very favorable and some of them are dangerous to us, but we need a diversity of bugs so that we don't Um, become a host to a lot of dangerous bugs. So it turns out that um, the immune system really is, begins with the gut. Now, pediatric microbiome deficiency in the gut has some causes. And this is the money slide tonight. This is the one you want to screenshot. Allergies, especially food, result from reduced microbial diversity in the gut. And these are the reasons. Processed food, especially ultra processed food, sugar, fat additives, things like emulsifiers and flavorants, and even the plastic packaging that's on there are problems for us. And then the lack of diversity of our food, 75% of our food comes from only 12 species of plants and five species of animals, which is pretty poor. And we'll talk a little more about that. Then C-section babies. We have a, um, I think the rate of C-sections is up around 30% and the the World Health Organization wants us down at 10%. There are a lot of reasons for this, but if you're lucky enough to be born through a vagina, picking up the vaginal microbiome, which is rich in bacteria and the anal 
uh, microbiome from feces from um, during delivery and then crawling up on the skin, your body becomes seeded or inoculated with mom's bacteria. In the first three days of life, your body becomes a bacteria factory, producing enough gut bacteria that you can digest breast milk, which is um, which mom's breasts are are moving from colostrum to breast milk. So it all works out perfectly unless we're taken out of a relatively sterile cavity, the uh, womb, and brought into the world bypassing all of this. So we begin with a microbial uh, restriction to be to start. Then we have the child's antibiotic history, and especially a lot of our airway kids have earaches, um, and those are increased from bottle feeding versus breastfeeding. 80% of the antibiotics that we're exposing our kids to are through the livestock, milk and meat received, um, again, through farm animals that are really not living on the farms you picture in your mind. They're living in um, terrible quarters where they're giving them antibiotics, not just for immunity to disease, but to fatten them up quickly because we know antibiotics increase hunger and they become fatter quicker. So that's a real problem. So if you want research on this, there's a lot of good studies. This is a, a large um, review on the role of the microbiome in food allergies. And, and it talks about the fact that we're just not there with probiotics. We can't really fix this. What we need to do is try to prevent it. So in our practice, we work a lot with parents on the eight food pillars for eating for, for food behavior and what to eat and helping people increase diversity of foods. We want them to eat whole foods, not ultra processed, more, anim, more plants than animals, and especially those of color. Uh, and um, I'm going to interrupt you just for a question like you asked, because it, it's relating to what you just covered. Um, infants are not eating junk food. Are you saying that breastfeeding alters the infant microbiome in a negative way? Or are you saying formula is junk food? Not sure how to read this in the infant discussion. Okay. So formula is not junk food. It's the best we can do to simulate breast milk. Breast milk is always best. I'm talking about, inter first of all, mo what moms are eating and producing milk, right? Because we know that that is a direct, um, uh, a direct relationship. But we also need to look at how we introduce whole foods when a child's able to sit up and hold their head up. Um, and I'm a big fan of baby led weaning, of introducing real food to children rather than pouches or period foods or puffs or ultra. Pro you know, you see them walking around with little bags of of ultra processed foods, crackers and puffs of all kinds. So um, I don't know if I really answered that question, but I hope I touched on it. Um, but I, it's our opportunity um, as parents um, to influence a child for a lifetime. I like to say it's time to take your fridge, freezer and pantry by storm and own them. Your children can only eat what you bring home. And we need to teach parents to get back to basic foods and step away from ultra processed foods. Um, I won't go into it, but there was an article that came out a few weeks ago about such an increase in cancer, oral pharyngeal, oral, sorry, pharyngeal um, esophageal cancer from ultra processed foods increased 24% by just eating 10% more processed food. So when we look at how to avoid allergies, we want early feeding. The American Academy of of allergy of allergy and um, in, asthma allergy and immunology changed their recommendation from avoiding allergic food, uh, allergenic foods to introducing them early with the rest of their foods. So that's something for us to know and to be able to advise our parents. And believe me, I'll go into more detail on this when we're meeting for a full day. But we're trying to, if we have a child that already is eating a very narrow group of food, like the little girl you saw with the allergies, she was living off Annie's mac and cheese and um, chicken nuggets. And that's all she would eat. And that's what her mom said. Yeah, that's what she had to eat. So to move from this to this is not that hard for kids. Their brains are very brainwashable. We call this neuroplasticity. We begin to develop habits or I'm sorry, preferences around the things that we habitually eat. When your children are hungry, they will eat what is in front of them. If they're not hungry, eventually they will get hungry. 
Thank you for the applause on that. We need to provide healthy food that is palatable for children and they will eat when they're hungry. Our job is to provide the food. Their job is to eat when they're hungry. We don't feed them crap because they can't, because they won't eat it. So thank you for all the hearts on that. This is my niece. Um, again, she's like probably eight months old or uh, maybe nine months old. And she's at our dinner, to our um, Mother's Day brunch, and she's eating everything we're eating. You notice she's using her hands. She's pinching it. What does she have? Strawberries and avocado and eggs. She's eating what we're eating at our breakfast. This is baby led weaning, not bottle or not pouches, not jars of period foods. This is her about six months later attacking her mom's lunch. She's going after the salad. Now she's lucky to have had an early start. What is she eating in there? She's eating lettuce and avocado and corn. She gets tired of trying that fork. So she goes in and dives in with her hands, but they're playing, they're using, they're eating food and they're chewing. And the mastication of food also increases our ability to expand that oral cavity. And this is the little girl who had to learn to shift from Annie's mac and cheese and chicken nuggets to vegetables. And with a little help from the food pillars and from me, she has done that in about three months time. She was also diagnosed with that obesity by our pediatrician. And now, now look at her in three months time. Dr. Simpson, I'm eating asparagus, pasta salad, and pasta is That's dinner. not pasta salad. What kind of salad? Is it just salad? I'm eating asparagus salad and peppers for dinner. How is it? It's so good. It's so good? Okay. I love you. Bye. I love you. Bye. Is that so cool? So we have the influence to be able to do that. We have the power to be able to do that, especially if you're seeing infants and you're teaching parents how to feed kids. And we also want to encourage outdoor play versus indoor play. They can explore the entire outside. We belong outside. We want to get dirty. We really do. The only thing kids need to avoid is animal feces. And other than that, they can play in rivers and streams and beaches and forests and grass, and they can dig and they can come in dirty. And we don't need to worry about over sanitizing. Now, there's so much indoor play for lots of reasons um, that we are missing the microbial diversity of the outdoors. And this is definitely increasing our allergy potential in kids. We also want to have babies meet their pups, the younger, the better. Mom's exposure to a dog during pregnancy and baby's exposure decreases allergies and eczema by 30% and asthma by 20%. Why is that? Because dogs go outside and they bring the outdoor microbiome in to the babies. If you're interested in this and want to read more, and you're not able to attend the full day seminar that we're doing with Airway Health Solutions, you can take a look at both of these books. I love them. Let them eat dirt and also missing microbes have the overuse of antibiotics is fueling our modern plague. Um, when we have when we have opportunities to look at how to do nasal clearing, both with exercises, and we're going to talk more about how to help with nasal clearing, especially before bedtime, with xylitol with um, neil meds, with a saline rinses, with mouth taping. And I love Kelly Richardson's new book, The Very Stuffy Nose, that teaches kids how to really put themselves in the driver's seat for a healthier future. Um, she, her son Finn develops the mantra, I'll keep my mouth closed and breathe through my nose. I'll keep my mouth closed and breathe through my nose. And we need to teach kids what we're doing and why we're doing that and the importance of communicating that. So I'm almost done. I want to take questions, but if you're interested in some more support materials from today, um, I'd like to have you scan the QR code and collect some of those. Molly, my personal assistant, put some things together for you from our office in Pediatric Airway, including those eight food pillars that I know you'll want to develop and give to your kids. You can use ours or you can develop your own, but those food pillars are super important to help parents learn how to raise healthy kids. Um, 
just a bit about me. I was, uh, I grew up with two parents who smoked two packs a day each. Um, unfortunately my mom was told by her pediatrician uh, as an anxious pregnant woman, since she already had a three month old baby when she got pregnant, that she could decrease, she could help her anxiety if she increased her smoking. So she doubled her smoking while she carried me. And I was born with uh, premature with bad lungs. And I spent three months in an oxygen tent and was obviously exposed to secondhand smoke, which was not even a thing back then. So I was in and out of the hospital seven times for pneumonia under the age of 12. And it's pretty scary not to be able to breathe. I grew up um, overweight as a result of the antibiotics and um, sedentary lifestyle. I was on allergy shots twice a week. I had um, I had, I couldn't exercise without wheezing. I couldn't sleep anywhere else without my medicine. And I had, I had the help of a physician at the age of, of, um, 13 years old who really helped me, um, get my life back together. She was an internist. My pediatric, uh, physician gave up on me and I had, um, a really, really brave young internist who helped me back to life and changed my life. Um, but she didn't meet with me once every six months. Like we do. She started saying, I need to see you weekly. And she started helping me learn how to exercise my lungs, to expand my lung capacity, to eat better, to sleep better. And within a couple of years, I was an, I was a, an athlete I was eating nutritiously. I was shopping for groceries and panniers on my bike. I was cooking for my family. I converted my entire family and my parents quit smoking. So it was um, a powerful, powerful um, time in my life. I know that that's not what we want for our kids, for them to change role, you know, to exchange roles with your parents so young. I felt like I was in charge of my family at that point. Um, that is not necessarily something that I want to be proud of. I think my mom, who was a psychologist later, felt tremendously guilty about all that. But I will say that I know what kids are capable of. And I know how powerful they can be if we engage them. And one of the things that I want to talk about during the full day that we're together is how do we engage children with indelible memories that will help them learn about their health and tackle their own health? So we can, you know, parents are often stuck in a rut and it's kids who can do the work. And so the hands-on learning lab, many of you know about that. We're going to talk a lot more about pediatric involvement in, in their own solutions and how to help them understand it. So anyway, I believe there's no such thing as other people's children. I hope you do too. And I really, really love this because I want to thank all of you for being leaders. If you're on this call, you're a leader. We are ahead of our profession and leadership is not about power. It's about responsibility. And we are holding the beam for other people to walk across. And it's up to us to continue to spread this message, to find followers, to get people clued in and to do it in such a loving way that they can't help it, not to browbeat them and make them feel ashamed for what they're not doing, but a way to say, how much fun we're having changing lives and allowing children to reach their full potential. Here's my cell number and my email. And once you get that, I'll stop sharing and we can answer some questions. Well, thank you for a wonderful presentation. And what's so great about this is that we do have it recorded and um, we do post it to our website uh, as well. So you can share this with your colleagues. You can share this with patients as well as our other conversations. But I love how you you go full circle. You started from experience. You're also a mother. You, you wrote your book about your experience as a mother with your son, Hunter. Uh, and I just love the whole full circle. And that now you're helping so many people as well as professionals use their power to pass it on. So thank you for paying it forward. It's really amazing what you do. Thank you so much. One of the questions um, online is, is, it says very powerful, first of all, what are your thoughts on babies that are allergic to eggs and have eczema? Again, I think you have to look at those principles. Um, we don't stop with eggs altogether. Now, I'm not an allergist. So I know that the what happened during the time when we started introducing hyperallergenic foods later, like eggs, were that 
we had a massive increase in allergies. So the American Academy of Allergies, Asthma, and Autoimmune Diseases circled back and said, we're going to do just the opposite. We're going to introduce them younger. And if they're allergic, we'll take them away for a while and we'll reintroduce them slowly again. And I will tell you that we haven't figured it out because we haven't seen the trend slow down. We are just seeing more and more allergies. I think that we need to get kids, stop over sanitizing our world, stop with the overuse of antibiotics and dentistry is notorious for that uh, because we're not taking teeth out. We're just antibioticing them and referring them to pediatric dentists and, or, and oral surgeons. We have to, um, we have to be very, very cautious about, you know, the, the needless, um, C-section rate. If, you know, talk to parents about why it's important to have a vaginal delivery if they can. Uh, we also really want to encourage outdoor play and most importantly, increase the diversity of our foods. But in terms of um, specifics, and I know Lauren, you made a really nice um, disclosure ahead of time saying, I am not an allergist. I'm not telling you to reintroduce eggs to your child. I'm telling you to work with your allergist, but I do know that we have we have not declared victory on why well, you just eliminate eggs or you just eliminate dairy. You just go gluten-free for the rest of your life. That is not how it works. Okay. There is something called celiacs that is a true allergy um, that can be quite dangerous. But other than that, food sensitivities need to be, you know, in my mind, we need to increase our diversity, not continue to restrict and restrict and restrict. Okay, then you can see um, some of the questions in the uh, queue here. What type of expander is recommended for young children under five years old? Do you have a preference, Dr. Maples, Susan? So, so we didn't talk about expanders at all, I but know. it's funny that we always get these kind of I questions. Know. Um, under five, I think you have to decide whether a child is very compliant or not. I like fixed, I like uh, removable expanders because parents can take them out and move them easily, but I like fixed expanders for kids that are not that compliant. I'm using um, hang expanders right now, but arch development under the age of five. I mean, I, I have really good luck with upper uh, removable. I usually do lower fixed, but I don't, um, but I don't, I don't have a, you know, they all do about the same thing. You know, I think we're all afraid that we're putting the wrong appliance. We're doing the wrong thing. We just need to make more tongue volume. And then we see less crowding and we see cheekbones develop. And we see the, when you, when you're expanding the palate, you're also expanding the nasal cavity, right? Because the, the floor of the mouth is the roof of the mouth is the floor of the nose. So we start to see tremendous help in children. We just need to expand. And again, my talk is all about Maybe we could avoid it all together if we can get a child breathing through their nose and breathing well for their whole life. So what's we'll the first, thank you. What's the first step for parents to take uh, with airway concerns? Um, wh when they have airway concerns? Yeah, for the child. The hardest, part, the hardest part is to find a dentist who's astute in airway. There are very, you know, physicians don't, don't have any exposure to the mouth and they're and 85% of them are not recognizing airway disorders. Um, I would say the first step would be to uh, document it. So to take some notes and to take a video and to take it and to find an airway astute dentist. And that is not an easy thing to do as Lauren, as you know, as we all know. So, but getting better, getting better. Getting better, getting better. <laughs> What advice do you have for addressing nutrition in families that are socioeconomically challenged? Um, it's cheaper to eat well. And I know most people don't think that, but we can teach them how to do it. If you're eating, uh, if you get rid of a box of sugared cereal and go to non-sugared cereal, even if you're eating ultra processed food, you go to Cheerios without sugar, it's cheaper. If you go to natural peanut butter, you have peanuts ground, it's often cheaper than than hydrogenated peanut butter. If you buy, if you can't, if you feel like you can't, like if you're looking at like Costco and Sam's where we have huge amounts of organic produce for really good low cost, that's great. But frozen vegetables work also. And so they're, they're saving money that way. I think ultra processed food is expensive. 
blue Gatorade and hot Cheetos are expensive and it's not nutritious. So I think that we can, um, you know, help parents learn. I ideally, I would love to have a whole cooking school above my dental practice where families can come and learn how to prepare foods and um, how to stock up refrigerator pantry and for sustainable foods. I mean, there are all kinds of ways to eat healthy that are not, not as expensive. So sits into the parent be with a young child's mouth breather using tape during sleep. Uh, say that again. How persistent should a parent be with a young child mouth breather using tape during sleep, mouth tape? Well, you don't want duct tape. <laughs> that, that's not the kind of persistence we want. You want <laughs> kids to accept it. So we typically work with them. I, I pulled out some tape on a patient today. I gave him a piece. I gave his mom a piece. I had them both put it on at the same time. I had him take it off. I said, put it on any way you want. And he said, why am I doing it? And I said, I'm going to tell you as soon as you have the tape on. So while you're listening to me, I'll tell you why. And and then I had him take it off. And so mom can see that it's very easy to take off too. And um, I said, start at story time or start at movie time. And then eventually work to uh, within you know a week or two, work to nighttime. Because we really want to try to, if a child's capable of breathing through their nose and they just have a habit of popping their mouth open, it's a nice way to remind the soft tissue. We also want parents actively involved in helping kids press their lips together when they're babies or if they are communic if they're an age where they can verbally communicate to um, tap their chin or to the mom tap her chin to signal so they're not always nagging, close your mouth, close your mouth. We want them to be able to tap their chin just to indicate to close the mouth. And we want babies, children knowing uh, what they're trying to achieve, which is one of the reasons I really like Kelly Richardson's book. And what about the child who's a habitual yawner to the extreme? Have you? Oh, I don't know. Really. Yeah, I, I don't know that either. That's interesting. So I thought I'd just ask you. Okay. I, there's a question here about is when and where is the full day with Dr. Susan? So I'm going to go ahead and, and share that right now. And actually okay. like a drum roll, please almost that like the moment I've been waiting for, for so long, ever since I saw you on stage at Palooza last year, I just knew that one day you'd be on faculty and we're so thrilled to have you. And we were trying, you have so much material that we're trying to you know, um, have a solution for everybody, what what you could help us in, in a day in, in an immersive course. And tell us a little bit about what we have in store. It's going to be April 5th online. Tell us, tell us all about it. I can hardly wait. Well, I actually kind of hinted through it. Um, mm -hmm. I we do a lot of interesting things with kids. This will not be just an airway course. Um, we're going to talk a lot about nutrition because, again, we talked about nutrition today. We're going to talk about um, hands-on learning. We're going to talk about communication with parents and how to um, be curious and, and try to get parents on board without being judgmental or pushy. I don't think that works very well, um, especially when you're introducing a, a flaw about a child. So we'll talk some about communication. We will also talk about some treatment mo modalities and intervention. And then I really, really want to talk about how to get those co-referral collaborative relationships in your community such that you have a community of physicians and dentists working together to help these kids because we cannot do it alone. You need good supportive EMT, you need um, or ENT, you need uh, a really good myofunctional therapist, you need a good allergist, you need couple of good pediatricians you need. We're going to talk about lip and tongue ties. We're going to talk about intervention um, early and what and where the pushback is from and how we need to be respectful of of doing this correctly if we're doing it. So we'll we'll talk about all kinds of all kinds of things. Before we went live, we were talking about the learning lab that you do, which I, I love this idea. And it actually, you said it it brought on future orthodontists, right? <laughs> like they, you had patients who went through your learning lab and now they are. Um... 46 of our patients, our physicians, our, our, I'm sorry, our dentist, pediatric dentist or orthodontist. They grew wow. up doing hands-on learning at every visit. Every child, every visit does hands-on science so they can better understand their health. They also get a really, really nice um, exposure to, um, to 
to dentistry. And Lauren, I certainly can focus more on that if you'd like me to during that day. Um, I think it's fabulous. We don't polish teeth because there's no efficacy in polishing. We stain the plaque on their teeth with two-tone and the child chooses whatever they want to clean their teeth. They have a mentored approach to self-care where they do their own plaque removal. And then they do hands-on science experiences. And there are, I don't know, 78 science experiences in the hands-on learning lab kit. So um, our hygienists sit literally in a science lab with them doing science. And then every time I come in for a handoff, they go tell Dr. Susan what you learned today. And it is just incredibly fascinating. Um, so it's fun. Kids get really excited about dentistry. Yep. Well, we need some girl power on our faculty. And we're also so thrilled that uh, we have this course to offer on April 5th. And uh, we are offering an introductory rate um, for $200 off the course. It's priced at $9.99. You can go to the website. This is just for our uh, listeners today who are listening to the conversation, the $200 discount. Uh, so take advantage of that until the end of the month. And it's going to be a wonderful, wonderful day. Um, I wanted to share some other resources uh, with you. The Brave Parent is is great. This should be in your waiting room. Uh, it's it's wonderful to have these discussions, and then to, you don't have to have an hour consultation. Just give them this book, you know. And many times they'll return it, so you know, you can get a few copies and have it, and it'll help you with your patient education. And also, the patients really appreciate you taking the time and um, the resources to help them learn more about being a brave parent. So thank you, uh, Dr. Susan, for for organizing that. Well, we're both on the board for the Children's Airway First Foundation. It's a wonderful foundation and they do offer so many resources for you. And I don't think enough people know about this. So please visit childrensairwayfirst.org. They have wonderful, wonderful resources for practitioners and for parents. Um, you did a wonderful podcast on there, Dr. Maples. You can They can hear that as well. Uh, and it's very parent friendly. So please check them out and consider um, a small donation if you find them helpful. Another uh, resource is this Empowered Sleep Apnea book. I actually recommend this in your reception room because it opens up the dialogue as why is there a sleep apnea book in the dental office? And it's really well-written. Uh, Dr. Dave, um, David McCarty, he was on our program not too long ago. We are extending this 20% off until the end of the month. And it's really a beautiful book that you will enjoy and patients will enjoy. It's very patient friendly. So please consider that. And then we also ask you to join our Airway Health Meetup Facebook group. Um, you can go ahead, go to Facebook, and we'd love to have you aboard. Uh, we share resources there as well as upcoming events. So to stay in the know, please join us for that. And these airway dentists, like you're saying, Dr. Maples, um, it's very difficult to find dentists who are like-minded. And if you are a dentist, an airway dentist, a dental office, we want you to be on the locator uh, once you have the training through Airway Health Solutions. So we just are sure about that we all have the same overarching philosophy. So please feel free to uh, reach out for more about that. We do have a global locator as well. And I'm just going to go ahead and do some our upcoming courses real quick while I have this PowerPoint going. We have our pediatric mini residency coming up January 19th. This is really the entry into being an alumni with AHS. This is how you get into our airway dentist locator as well as into our alumni, which is more like a family, a community. We have a private fa Facebook page as well as quarterly town halls and, and a lot of support. So here are the dates. I'm going to go through this rapid fire uh, because I'll send you some follow up information on the dates for 2024, but we have our mini residency with Dr. Mar ben Moralia for our adults as well, teaching adult removable expansion as well as clear aligner therapy that's coming up February 9th. We have our another new course with Dr. David McCarty. That's Friday, February 23rd. I almost think this should be a mandated course for everyone should really learn about sleep apnea and screening. And it's so complex that he does a wonderful job of unpacking the complexity of sleep apnea in a very hands-on um, and, and easy to understand matter. And also humorous manner. He has a great sense of humor, so you will enjoy the day as well. That's going to be Friday, February 23rd. We are honoring a $200 discount um, through, we're going to do it through the end of the month as well for the new year. We really want everyone on board with screening for sleep apnea, so please take advantage of that. 
Our advanced menu residency is available on demand. Uh, we will have it at the beginning of May, but go to our website and then you can see all of our courses that we are now offering on demand with 30 day accesses. This is Dr. Um, Michael Gelbs, a TMD to ortho. We have something for everyone to get them along the solution they need to provide airway in their practices. This is um, ba basically the prequel to ortho, if you would, to get the acute TMD patient ready for ortho. So we also offer a free 30-day um, uh, access as well as becoming an Air Vada provider. And then you can also have half-day in-office shadowing with Dr. Gelb in Manhattan. So check that out or set up a call with me. I'd love to go over this in more detail. Dr. Kevin Boyd's on the call today too. He, I love how he always joins these calls because he's a, a curious learner, just like you, Susan. And he's on the call today, but he has a wonderful um, advanced mini residency where he really um, wants you to take Dr. Moralia's course first, just to kind of get the baseline um, information and knowledge down. And then he'll focus on fixing under six. So it's craniofacial uh, development of the respiratory complex of the craniofacial respiratory complex under six. And he does a wonderful job as teaching his techniques of how he does this with his- One of my greatest mentors. I can. Yes. <laughs> so we have this on demand because everyone's- um, uh, schedules are really busy. And then you can actually shadow Dr. Uh, Boyd in his office, which um, everyone has loved this. So you take the on demand, you have um, uh, time with Dr. Boyd in the private Facebook group, and then you can go visit his office at a half price price in office shadowing for the alumni. It's a wonderful, wonderful opportunity. So please take advantage of that. Same thing with Dr. Brett Christensen, uh, he's on demand. So take a look at our website. You can learn all of these uh, wonderful masters who have been doing this for a lifetime, how they do it. it these are all technique courses. So you can, we, we like you to take them all so then you can adapt your own um, techniques to, to however you see these key, uh, key resources, put it together for your own uh, learning. Uh, we have our AHA uh, School of Mayo, and now we are um, uh, an affiliate of the IAOM. So if you want to continue with this introductory, introductory Mayo course, you can go on to get your COM certification. We are offering a $500 discount uh, to the end of the month, and we are thrilled with this new re revamped intro course starts on February 7th. I think we have three spots left for that one. And then Brittany also does in-office shadowing as well. I wanted to just share with you some upcoming events um, just in the industry because it's so hard to keep track of everything, but we're excited. I, I know, Susan, you can't come to this one, but we are, um, there's an AAGO midwinter meeting and that's next week and that'll be in Phoenix. And we're honoring um, Professor John Mew and Dr. Dave McCarty is the keynote speaker. So there's still time to sign up for that. And we do have a code, $100 off. I mean, I'm, I'm so thrilled to be able to meet Professor Mew in person. And I hope if you can, it would be a wonderful, wonderful trip of a lifetime, really, to, to learn from the father of expansive orthodontics. Love his book. Love his book. Yeah, it's going to Amazing. And we're also have the pulmonots are performing that night. So I'm really excited. Hope I get my voice back in order by then. I've been a little bit under the weather. So that'll be a really a, a great time to just celebrate and really honor John Mew. So uh, there's a picture of the, the pulmonots. And then um, I'm thrilled that uh, Dr. Maples, you're speaking again for Airway Palooza. And um, it was just, you did such a wonderful job last year and I can't wait to see you again, but let's talk a little bit about um, what your part of the, of the Palooza is gonna be and the pediatric component. You're gonna close us out. I don't know. <laughs> what idea? I think, you're gonna tell me what I'm talking about. I have so much, but I, I know, you're gonna be advice. doing, I think you said you're gonna agree to do airway health screening every day, how to uh, implement that into your oh. office because you don't have to treat, but you have to screen. So you're gonna oh, yeah. give us nice, easy tools. You need to see it, yep. Okay, wonderful. So nice. that's gonna be um, March uh, 15th and 16th in New Orleans. And we can have a $150 off coupon. We will give you all this information at the end and we can set up payment plans for you as well. Dr. Gerald Simmons has his 20th annual dental sleep conference. That's uh, coming up also April 4th through the 6th. So um, if you're interested in that, we do get discounts um, through um, Dr. Simmons. So thank you for sharing that. And here are some free events for everybody. 
We have, um, I'm super excited. We're holding a master class, a free master class, the indications research and risk benefit ratio on tongue tie releases. And that's with Dr. Baxter, Dr. Kotlow and Dr. Siegel. And we're gonna have a panel um, a, a discussion after. It's two and a half CEs. Most of you don't need CEs, but we're like, we love to offer that. And we just really wanna focus on on getting to the truth of tongue ties and kind of, you know, debunking any myths and, and any bad press that was recently, um, that we recently had to kind of debunk. So we're going to have a wonderful full evening. So save the date, January 24th, registration is live, and that'll be in the follow-up email. I'm thrilled that I'm having Sharon Moore. Uh, she's going to be joining us for our next conversation, and that'll be uh, in February, uh, February 7th. And she's going to be talking about public health, how it's everybody's job uh, with children. So that's Children's um, Airway Health Month as well. And then we're going to have another one. <laughs> the role of the dental team in early warning signs of sleep disorder breathing. Uh, that'll be February 24th. And you can actually invite your parents and patients to attend this one. It'll be parent friendly. So this way you can help them with your patient education. And for our alumni, we will have our town hall right after our AHS conversation. So, wow, we have a lot of events going on. It's busy. Oh, in it. Holy oh, smokes. I just wanted to make sure we finished up by nine o'clock. And um, we're just gonna finish off with the raffle. So I'm gonna go ahead and have um, Jay, who's gonna be my director. Why don't you go ahead and, and do the raffle for us? I'll stop my share. And I think Jay's gonna go ahead and take over and, and do that raffle. Okay, let's see who the lucky winner is. Julie Canning, you are our lucky winner for this evening. So we have a winner and you are now uh, invited to attend virtually to the Airway Palooza. If you want to attend live, you can reach out to us and we can work something out, but congratulations. It's always fun to win something. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and then stop my screen, uh, screen sharing. So that's a wrap. We finished a little bit at 9.02. Um, Dr. Maples, thank you. Susan, thank you so much uh, for joining us tonight. You are a, a gift to dentistry, and we are so thrilled that you shared your expertise with us. Um, I don't know if you want any closing remarks or give any vote of confidence to anyone who's just kind of maybe on the fence of, of getting into airway. I just want to say that I hope that there was nothing that I said that was so intimidating that you feel like you can never get there because you are enough just by being here tonight. Uh, we're all on this journey at different levels. And um, my hope is to just invite you in to learn. I love it when we ask questions that we can't answer because that stimulates more learning. So don't be afraid to ask silly questions. And someone answered, by the way, the, the yawning question about Bottega breathing on there, on there which I loved. So thank you. Thank we are you. all in it together. And um, I am excited to see all of you on a day of learning in April and also at Airway Palooza. And I'm excited for all that you're doing, Lauren. And I'm so grateful for you and your work. Thank you. We're thrilled to have you on faculty and we're thrilled to have everyone here tonight. We really appreciate um, your support and we love that everyone's so passionate and thank you for doing what you do and being part of our community. So good night, everybody. See you at Palooza.